What about the other uh, things in the equation, the unconventional oil deposits and gas? Um, everything's rising in terms of production at the moment, but we worry about investment shortfall. We worry about aged infrastructure. Much of the infrastructure was put in in the 1980s. The tar sand flow rates I've talked about already, way too low uh, to make much difference. Coal to liquids, CTL. Flow rates too low, gas to liquids, flow rates too low, even if you don't worry about emissions. Um, oil shale technology, but there's just no way to, you hear about the oil shales, but no one has technology for ex exploiting oil shale. Um, now, shale gas, that's a different question. We can come to perhaps in questions, but gas is needed for power. There are shortages of power as well, not for motive power. Now, here's the thing. Um, who's going to do this? The average age in the international oil industry, I wonder if you can imagine what it is. We're talking about the whole thing internationally, a shell figure calculated, all the new graduates, all the young people being hired. What do you think the average age is of the people in this industry? The answer is 49. The average retirement age is 55. This could be their biggest problem. We would refer to it as a legacy skills problem. That's the technical job. Who's going to do it? Who's going to keep meeting this production um, requirement in our oil-addicted societies? So this is what we think is coming, even with gas, even with shale gas, this kind of pattern. This is from our 2008 uh, report. Our view then, before the credit crunch, was that um, supply would start failing to meet demand within just a few years from now, a year or so from now. But this is before the recession, which clearly we didn't see coming, along with everyone else. And that has delayed things because oil demand did fall in the recession. This is the International Energy Agency, who in 2008, around the same time as our report, for the first time, you might ask why they didn't do it before, looked at the peak uh, looked at the production of existing oil fields in the world in blue there, and lo and behold, they found we're at the peak of existing fields. And then in the pastel shades, how they think we're going to have to ramp up all the other stuff we need, fields yet to be developed, yet to be found, enhanced oil recovery, um, and then of course the massive expansion of tar sands, which begs all the questions about climate change and everything else. So, we're here to tell you that that is six Saudi Arabia's worth of new oil production that is needed to keep the global economy on its oil-addicted tracks. And there isn't a snowball's chance in hell of that happening. And what's more, if you read the IA report, they know it uh, as you read between the lines. Yet, the Labour government in August 2009 Few authors advocating an imminent peak take account of factors such as the role of prices in stimulating exploration, investment, technological development, and changes in consumer behavior. Proven reserves, mantra coming out straight out of BP's annual report, are equal to over 40 years of current production. Complacent and wrong on the massive balance of probabilities. <laughs> Here's our 2010 report, um, where you see our prediction of the peak. We think it will come by 2015 at the latest, and will fall fairly steeply beyond that. You can see various other curves there, the International Energy Agency's prediction of what demand will be, and um, our strong growth concern, which is that the economies of India, China, and the Middle East maintain course. So this is a recipe for disaster that would occur on our watch. The sad thing about all this is that the fossil fuel dependent economies are giving us climate ruined by increments with those for the eyes to see. And yet we have, um, in closing, all these survival technologies. This is a separate talk that I don't have time to give, but you get the picture. We don't have to be doing things this carbon dependent way. And with a bit of luck, we won't. We see um, snapshots all around the place of what could be done. This is a project that my company did with Scottish and Southern Energy, 
has 10 homes for low-income workers in Slough. This um, little community uh, with those new build houses will generate no emissions whatsoever. We need no oil, no gas, no coal, no nuclear for that matter. And in fact, we'll be providing all the electricity and all the heating in this triple glazed, um, carefully insulated development, uh, such that with the solar tiles that you see on the roof there, uh, that's an architect's drawing, but here's the real thing, and four separate renewable energy technologies on site for heating, so the thermal, ground source heat pumps, air source heat pumps, and biomass, bio wood chip boiler, any one of those can do all the heating. And there's plenty left over. Any one of the heating technologies can work. The electricity being provided under grey British skies by those solar roof tiles provides way more electricity than all the lights and appliances need with plenty left over to charge the communal car, a mini. And just imagine a few years in the future, that wire you see going one way from the solar roof into the car, it'll be coming back the other way as we have a smart grid and the car is used as a battery system to store the electricity. And this is the future. You can smell it when you go to these, install these kinds of installations. And it's not just about new builds, it's about retrofit as well. So I think there was a very interesting article the other day in New Scientist by Catherine Mitchell, the um, Professor of Energy Studies at Exeter University, and she retrofitted her cottage, her old Cornish cottage. She found it so easy to get down to zero heating bills with just solar thermal on the roof, passive solar, massive insulation, all the rest of it, that she argues that um, people are going to discover this. There's going to be a, a wave of discovery of what we could do if we act together and skill share in our communities and our businesses work together in the way that GreenLinx fosters, of course, with sharing of information, pooled procurement, and all that sort of thing. And she says, Catherine, that, you know what, I've always, and this is a professor of energy studies, she says that I've always had the argument that we should say to the energy companies, um, just don't do generation, do energy services, and you still have your license to print money. Um, just change the way you do business. But you know, it's not like that. It's so easy to do this stuff, if you put your minds to it, that we can actually disintermediate these greedy energy, energy giants. And if we can do that with our energy production, we can do it with our finance as well. With our pensions, our bank deposits, our insurance premiums, and right now the bonus cultists invest willy-nilly in all their ruinous stuff and their building of obscene bonuses. And if we think together and act locally and refashion the way that um, businesses and communities work, which we're going to have to do anyway once this energy crisis hits us, we can get rid of the massive energy companies and the massive financial institutions who through their blindness, their greed, and their inertia are pushing our civilization currently towards a precipice. Thank you for listening to me.